Hi there, this is Lauren Kimball for ANI 150, and in the following tutorials, we will go over how to texture your Exercise One food can using both Photoshop and Substance Painter. By the end of these tutorials, you will be able to build a custom food can label in Photoshop and construct compelling texture maps in Substance Painter using the PBR workflow. PBR stands for Physical Based Rendering, and all that does is basically indicate what kind of maps we are going to be painting in order to achieve this look right here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Alright, so what you see here is the finished label for my food can. In order to follow along with me, you're going to need to have modeled and UV mapped your own low poly can. Everything you see here is dependent on the UV snapshot for placement. So if you don't have your model made and the UVs done, it's a moot point to continue this tutorial until it's done. So here, let me show you. If I turn on the background and I turn on the guide layer and I zoom in, you can see the UV snapshot overlaid on top of the graphic. This shows me exactly where the placement is of my shells within the texture tile and I can place all of the different assets and know exactly how it's going to show up on the 3D model. Okay? All right. So, our next step, or our first step to get to this point, is to find that UV snapshot, assuming you've already completed those steps, and bring them into Photoshop. So I'm going to go to File, Open. I'm going to go to my desktop, which is where my Exercise 1 directory is at, and I'm going to look for the Images folder. The Images folder is where everything goes that we kick out of, or every image goes that we kick out of Maya. So, UV snapshots, or renders for instance. Things we bring into Maya, that's the Source Images folder. So you've got to go to the Images folder. Alright, so in my Images folder, I see an out UV file. If you don't see this file, but you're sure that you made it, you're sure you did your UV snapshot, it's quite possible you didn't set your project correctly, and you're going to have to probably find the images folder for the default project that's, um, let's see, I think it's under Autodesk, Maya, default, uh, it's been a hot minute since I used it. But you're going to have to hunt it down, and you'll have to pull it out of the images folder there. Probably easier if you back into Maya and make a new snapshot. Once you have that snapshot, you're going to go ahead and open it in Photoshop. Depending on if you followed a previous tutorial or you followed along with me in class, you might have used a different file format than PNG. Sometimes I use PNG, sometimes I use TIFF. Uh, generally, I like to use file formats that have transparency information, and I like file formats that have lossless so it doesn't compress things. Uh, it doesn't matter if I use something different, you can still follow along. And if you created a file format that doesn't have transparency, you can follow along even with that. It's just going to be slightly different. So I'll address that in a moment. Uh, ideally, if you have it with um, transparency information like a PNG, it's already going to be nice and transparent for you. If, I'm just going to do this very quickly, let's say you had a JPEG and it looked more like this, where it's a single layer and it's all white. Well, you could grab this and set it to multiply, which is a blend mode. And then anything that I draw underneath it, like let's grab the brush tool and just, oops, go back to a default brush. There we go. Shrink it down. Be there. There. Anything I draw underneath that, as you can see, is going to bleed through. So if you have a solid color, no worries. Just apply a blending mode. Okay. So I'm going to undo all that, and we're just going to pretend that we are on the same page, and you have just a nice transparent UV snapshot. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create for myself a background layer because I don't like looking at these boxes. So if you're new to Photoshop, you can go down here and click the new, it's right next to the trash can, and that'll create a brand new layer. I'm going to double click this layer and I'm gonna name it background. I like to have a tidy and organized layer menu, so I name everything. 
I'm going to press G. G is the hotkey for paint bucket. If you're just opening up Photoshop, quite possible you have the gradient tool selected. Just hold on to that tool and you can select the tools underneath. The middle one is the paint bucket tool. Another thing you could do is hold down shift while tapping G and you see that you can actually toggle through all the tools that are within that particular box or associated with the G hotkey. So next I'm going to tap D. The reason is because it's going to reset my foreground and background swatches. If you are following along and you just opened up Photoshop, that's probably what yours look like. So I'm going to double click my, or just click my foreground color, and I'm going to choose a darker gray because it's easier eyes. You can use black if you want. And I'm going to fill in this background layer just so that it's easier for me to see the outlines of my UV shells. When I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and lock that layer. As for my guide layer here, I'm going to go ahead and name it Guide. I'm also going to lock that because I don't want to move anything by accident. If you go in and you accidentally move any of these shells, then you're going to lose the information of where your image is landing on the mesh. This has to stay exactly as you had it when you did the initial snap. All right, so the next thing I like to do personally in staying organized is I'm gonna grab both these layers. So click guide, hold down shift and grab background. And you're going, I'm going to go right click and color them red. I like to color code the layers that I don't want to draw on. It's just a little extra reminder of what's in there. All right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to go out and find a can label. Now, I already have one here, so if I, you can see all these images that I have kind of up here in the different tabs. I went online and I looked for a food can label and I found this old food, dog food, I don't know, maybe it's from the 50s, I don't see a date on there, but yeah, it's an old food can label. I'm going to go to my history, and I'm going to go back to the moment I opened it, so slightly different. Alright, so the first thing I want to address with this food label that I found is, and by the way, you don't have to choose dog food, you can choose any label you want, just go on to Google, search for a food label, Anything you want. It can be uh, for something old, it can be for something new. Heck, you can even go find a can label from your pantry and scan it if you want, but you need to have something you can work from. All right? So what I'm going to do first in this scan is n I notice that uh, the label isn't exactly perfectly laying, you know, perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertically. It's uh, slightly angled is what I'm getting at. So one technique I like to do is I like to press Control R. When I tab Control R, you'll see that a ruler at the top and side appears and disappears. When you have the ruler on, you can summon guide layers. So I'm going to go over here and click on the ruler and drag out a guide. So this is what a guide looks like. They're just these invisible lines that only Photoshop can see, but they're super helpful because they are perfectly vertical, perfectly horizontal. If I drag one from the top, there's perfectly horizontal. And I can use them to help make sure my image is being lined up correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this down until I've got kind of a corner here. So I'm holding down Z and I'm left mouse clicking to drag this. That's pretty close. And you can see just how angled this label is. So once I have that set, I'm going to press Control T and oh, Control A first. Control A selects all. When I press Control A, you can see these little marching ants. Once you've selected the area, then you press Control T. Control T is free transform. And then I'm going to just rotate this slightly and maybe move it up. Maybe rotate it a little more. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I do want to kind of adjust this so that it's lined up as ideally as I can get it. That looks pretty good. When I'm done, I can actually grab these guides and just slide them back up to the rulers, and they're gone. So the first thing I did was just sort of adjust the label so that it lines up a little nicer. Then grab my marquee tool right here, and oops. Notice the little marching ants are still there. I gotta pre I gotta get rid of those first. That's my previous selection. To let go of a selection you've made, the hotkey is Control D. 
So remember, control A selects everything, control D deselects everything. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to the corner of my label with my marquee tool. The marquee tool is right here, it's underneath the uh, like the four-way arrow right here. So grab that marquee tool, start from the corner of your rectangle label, and uh, just draw a box around it. Once you've done that, you want to press the hotkey Control C, which is copy. Now, you could have done this a couple other ways. You could have dragged this image in as a smart object and rasterized it. You could have. This is just my workflow. So if you want to do it a different way, you certainly can. But I'm just going to copy this can label. I'm going to go back to my out UV and I'm going to paste it. All right. Notice that my layer is sandwiched in between my guide and my background. I'm going to double click this layer and I'm going to name it label underscore base. So this is my labels base, right? And this is a layer that I want to work on. So I'm going to right click and just color code it green for now. Then I'm going to tap my V key, which grabs this four way arrow, this essentially your move tool. And you're going to grab your label line it up with your UVs, press Control T, and drag this out until it lines up with the other side of your UVs, close as you want to get it. And then I'm going to just push this down a little ways. You know, I didn't notice this last time, but I think this yellow bar is uh, probably on the food can itself, hidden by the other side of the wrapper. So I'm going to actually go ahead and extend this out a little further past the, past that. Yeah, I think this label is going to fit just a little bit better than my original. Ah, oh, it's so silly that I didn't notice that before. All right, cool. If I want to trim off the rest of what's there, I can just grab my marquee tool, select that little slither if I wanted to. I don't really care enough to. But if, yeah, actually, no, I do care. It's going to drive me nuts. I'm going to go ahead and select it and cut it. There we go. So now my label is laying nicely, pretty closely to my UV snapshot. It's okay if it bleeds over a little. In fact, it might be nicer if it did bleed over slightly so you know that there's not going to be a seam. There we go. And there's my label placed. For my next step, I'm going to turn off my guide because I don't really need it right now. And I'm going to use my magic wand tool. Now by default, where the magic wand tool is, you just tap W. And nowadays, the first tool that pops up is this, this object selection tool. But I like the old school magic wand tool, so I'm going to go grab it. And I'm going to, with the label base selected, I'm just going to click this open area out here. And what I've done is I've selected everything outside of my label. Now, if you see that this selection is grabbing parts of the, the label itself, it means that you've just got to alter the tolerance. You can adjust the tolerance up here, and as you tweak that tolerance level, it's going to become more or less sensitive in its selections. Okay, But the default 32 Sensitivity should work just fine. You shouldn't have it lead over unless, you know, unless you do. So what happens is when I select this outer area, it marquees everything outside of the label. I like to do this in order to select the label itself. What do I mean by that? I'm going to take this selection that I've made and I'm going to flip it. That's called inversing the selection. To do that, I'm going to press shift Control i And you'll notice if you can see it, um, depending on how big your viewer is or if you're just listening in, but you'll notice that the marching ants that were outside of this, so let's just, let me press Control Z. Notice the marching ants are grabbing the whole of the canvas and outside of the label. When I press Shift Control I, it inverses, and now my selection is grabbing the label itself. Once I've done that, I want to go over to my layers, grab my label base, and I'm going to go down here toward the bottom, like right next to the button creates a new layer, there's one that creates a folder. And I want to grab that label and put it in the folder. I'm going to call this folder my label folder. I'll just call it label. 
After I've done that, I'm going to click the folder, not the label base, the folder itself. And I'm going to click this, oops, click this button down here. Look, look toward the bottom of your screen. You see where it says FX, and then there's this button. It kind of looks like a rectangle with a circle cut out of the middle. That's your masking button. I'm going to go ahead and click that, and you'll notice that the folder changes up here. So now, instead of just being a folder, it's got a little link and a thumbnail that is both black and white. What I've done is created a layer mask, a layer mask attached to the folder. Now, what a layer mask does is it, it's like, it's like masking tape. You know, if you've ever had to paint a room or maybe paint something on it that you wanted to mask off, you put a strip of masking tape down so that when you're painting over the masking tape, you can remove the tape later and you protect the area underneath. It's going to be very similar in that regard. If I go over here and I click on the layer, uh, the label base, which make sure it's in that folder, it is. Let's just collapse. Yep. Okay. Just double checking. If I were to start painting this, uh, let's just reset the swatch to black, shrink down our brush, and let's say I just want to start coloring things black. Whoop! I shoot upward, and you'll see that it doesn't color anything above it. So the mask just keeps everything nice and cropped right in here. I mean, it's it's, a, it's an illusion, it, strictly speaking. I can just deactivate the, labor, label, <laughs> the layer mask and actually see it. I can also enable a layer mask, flatten it, and make the changes per permanent. I don't really find a reason to do that, because what I see is what I can export. But the whole idea of a layer mask is to just keep things nice and tidy within the image. So I only want to paint within this layer, within this label rather, sorry. So that's why I attached it. Now, the reason I attach it to the folder instead of the image is any new scene I, or any new layer I create within this folder has to adhere to that mask. So not just the image itself, but anything. Anything attached to this folder, as long as it has that mask on it, it has to adhere to the mask. So it's fun. It's cool. So now that I have set things up for, you know, cropping, make sure everything stays nice and tidy within my label area. I'm going to go ahead and start making some adjustments to this, kind of preemptively preparing for what I want. So my vision for this is to basically make a camp based on melon moss because I'm crazy about my breed. Um, the, or the final that I got over here, I've replaced the dog with a picture of a Malinois. I changed the name of the food to Hyper Dog Food. And I also changed the ingredient label and made it silly. So we zoom in close, you can see the ingredients. Instead of being barley, wheat, meat byproducts, that sounds like a terrible food. Uh, it's lion meat, Red Bull, espresso, gasoline, jet fuel. So it's just being silly. Okay? But those are areas that I want to replace. So this is, you know, this is what I would do to do that. Let's start by grabbing the label base and let's begin with this dog. Yeah, I'll start with him. That seems like a good place to start. I'm going to grab my lasso tool. It lives underneath the marquee tool. And if you have a stylus, that'd be great. But if, you, if you're pretty deft with your mouse, you can also use your mouse to select this. You wanna, oops, you wanna try to outline it as best you can. If you let go, like I just did, you can hold down, you can go over here to the settings. See how it's got a single square? Click on the square next to it. That is going to allow you to add to your selection. And if you hold down Alt, you can cut parts out of the selection that you just made. So now, letting go of Alt, now I'm just drawing. There we go. So you don't have to restart and mess up, for instance. So there's a lot of ways I could go about this. I'm going to just try to go about this the quickest way imaginable. Um, how about we try the content awareness fill and see if that gives us a promising result. I'm going to right click and click on content aware fill right here. And this window pops up and over here it shows you your selection and over here it shows you the output. I'm just going to press OK. And that did a pretty good job of removing the dog. I'm going to press Control D. Eh, nice. Now, what's really cool is the default settings for this tool 
you'll notice that there's a new layer. It's non-destructive. Whatever it's going to fill in, it puts on a separate layer. So that's really nice to know. I'm going to just rename this label. Let's call it um, fill, just so I know that that's the layer with all my fills on it. I'm going to go back to my label base, and this time I'm going to grab the word jumper. I'm going to try using the marquee tool. Now, if you select it, like, let me show you this. Let's say I started drawing this marquee and I realized I left part of the J out. I can actually hold down my space bar as long as I don't let go of the marquee tool and reposition that marquee. Get as close as I can, right click, and content aware. Cool, and that's working really nice. I don't really have much to clean up. Is it perfect? No. But that's okay, because this is just a fun little assignment. You don't have to make it perfect. Besides, we're going to be throwing a ton of dirt on this anyway, so. All right, next thing I wanted to clear out of here are this ingredient list. So let's do that again. Let's grab this with the marquee tool. Remember, if we didn't position it just right, we can hold down our space bar to, to reposition where we started. Let go. Make sure you grab your label base. Right click. Let's go to, oh, I'm sorry, I got to right click over here. Content Aware Fill. Ooh, that looks so clean, man. That is so nice. Now, not always when you use the Content Aware tool, it doesn't always give you such a nice result. Like, I'm pleasantly surprised. If you have to clean up your result, not a big deal. But the Content Awareness tool will at the very least get you part of the way there. So notice that it's creating new layers. So let's just shift select all the new layers, not the label base, just the new layers, and press Control E. And that's going to merge them all with the fill layer that was on the top. All right, so there's our fill layer. Cool, cool. And uh, I'm going to actually color this one green too. I'm going to use green as the color to indicate the label bits. All right, so I like that. My ingredient list has been taken out. Again, whatever is going on with your specific label, Feel free to take out and change and rearrange whatever you want. Let's go over here to Jumper. Remember, I'm changing the name of this food. I'll use the Marquee tool again. Select the word Jumper. Let's make sure I'm on the right layer. There it is, Label Base. I'm going to right click and let's do that uh, Content Awareness fill. Oh man, that's awesome. I even copied the little scratch in there. Man, this tool is rocking it today. Okay. I'm going to merge, control E, so it's all in the same fill. Let's zoom out. And let's take out these directions. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the label base. Oh, it erased my color. That's okay. I I'm sorry. I was just noticing that when I changed the label color and I merged, it got rid of it. No big deal. All right, right click, content awareness fill. Oh, good, looky there. If we zoom in, we can see. I say good because um, I kind of want to show you how to clean some things up. Now, in the content awareness fill, you can, you know, change the sampling area for something. Um, if I want to, I could take out dog food from the sampling area or add certain things and, you know, Try to get a better result. Uh, I don't care to do that. I'm not going to sit here and try to tweak this. I, I just want to move forward. I'm going to press OK. This is so much easier to work with right in here. I'm going to zoom in. And first, let's merge those layers. Oops, sorry. Cancel. Escape that. Control E. All right. And I'm going to use my, where are you? The stamp tool. Stamp tool would be a good one to use. And uh, sample current and below, so it's sampling both this layer, this one here, and it's also sampling the label. All right, so what does the clone tool do? The clone tool is going to paint with a sample area instead of a color. So if I grab my paintbrush tool, which is B, uh, it's going to paint with whatever colored swatch I have. So right now it's set to black. The clone tool. First, let's go ahead and hold down Alt. Notice that when I press Alt and I have that stamp tool. Is it stamp or clone? Oh, it's clone stamp. It's both, of course. I'm going to hold down Alt and a little target's going to appear. 
I can click on this area and it will paint using that sample. So you ought to reset it occasionally, but you generally able to get really nice quick results. And there we go. Let's zoom out. That looks great. Let's take care of some of these little spots just for giggle. You, 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 you. And there we have it. Now that we're done with uh, doing the content awareness fill, I'm going to go ahead and color this one more time. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put these both in their own folder. This folder, a folder within a folder, it's folder inception. And I'm just going to have this be my label base. I'll just name it label base. And that way I can come back and easily... It, the reason I like using folders is because of that collapsibility. Not just being able to put on masks, but it's nice because if you end up with like 50 layers, you can separate them into sections and you don't have to keep like constantly scrolling down to find what you're looking for. So everything in here has to do specifically with the label itself. And what I want to move on to next is bringing the dog in. So that's that's a graphic that's different base label. So let's see, where is that dog? Here it is. I'm going to go back into my history and start with what the dog looked like when I first brought it in. So I just found this picture on the internet. I copied it. Went to File, New, based my uh, new document on what was on my clipboard, which means whatever image I have copied, that's the resolution the document is going to adopt. Press Create, and then Paste it, which is Control-V, this image into a brand new, you know, ah, what did I just press? Oh, F, sorry. Oh, fun fact, sorry, I distracted myself. F allows you to go from this view to more of a full screen to a complete full screen. So if you know all your hotkeys and you don't want anything populating your screen, that is what I did. I just tapped F. Okay, sorry, right. So I pasted this image in and a brand new Photoshop page. And I could, if, I, if what I want is to take this dog away from its background could go in and lasso it, I could use content awareness, I could, you know, paint, um, try using magic wand. There's a lot of ways I could go about this. The quickest and easiest way is to go up to select and ask it to find the subject. More often than not, Photoshop will very quickly figure out, especially if there's not like a million things going on in your scene, uh, very quickly figure out who the main star is of your picture. And so I'm just going to press Control C and copy it. And let's go back to the Can UV. And I'm going to paste it. And there it is. Whee. Now I'm going to drag my Malinois. I'm going to call this Mal for short. And I'm going to stick it in this uh, label folder, like so, so that when I grab the Mal, it's got to stay in this label. All right, next I want to flip rotate it. So I'm going to go to edit. I'm going to go to transform and I'm going to say flip horizontal. There we go. Let's zoom in a little bit. Let's press control T rotate. So control T is free transform. Scale down. Just sort of place the dog where I think it would be funny. Now I'm going to press escape. If I press escape then without pressing enter, then it doesn't apply the transformation and I can start over. I'm going to turn off the mal for a second and go back to my label base. One of the cool things with having this fill, the content fill on a separate layer, is I could grab this separate layer and just drop the opacity ever so slightly, like let's like to 90. What's really cool is I can kind of see where the original artwork's at, and it can kind of guide me on how I position my new stuff. So I'm going to grab the mouth, control T, let's rotate it again, grab the corner, bring it down, and we can kind of just, that's pretty good, I like that, maybe, I like the paw kind of lining up with the swoop. 
this pivot point. If you don't see a pivot point, you can always activate the pivot point up here. That just allows you to rotate from a very specific point. Enter. Yeah, I like that. There you go. Now, unfortunately, because of the black mask on this dog, it's kind of sinking into the background. So if I hold down Z and I zoom, oops, no, I want to zoom the other way. You can kind of see the, the face is just disappearing from a distance. So let's, let's double click the layer and get into this layer, uh, this, um, this image's layer properties. Oh, it showed up on a different screen. The dangers of having three monitors. Okay, so when you double click a layer, it activates the layer styles. And layer styles are a series of options you can do, like little bonus options that you can do to kind of help add extra pizzazz to your, to your layer. Uh, things like drop shadow, that's a really common one, or outer glow. I'm going to go with um, uh, color, no, no, not color, stroke. That's what I'm looking for. I'm going to go to stroke. Go into the stroke properties. I want this to be on the outside of my image. Let's scale this up. Oh, there we go. It looks pretty good. Um, I want to go with a different color, though. Click this swatch. This yellow. So it kind of matches better. You can also drop the opacity or increase the opacity. Oh, that's so much better. Let's press OK. So what's cool is I can see this little extra set of eyeballs down here. I can turn on and off my filters or my effects and see if I like it better with the effects or without. It's subtle, but it definitely helps the dog pop more. And because it's the same yellow as the rest of the label, it goes well together. All right, so I'm happy with the placement of the dog. Let's do the text next. So I'm gonna label this blue for my images. And uh, let's go ahead, just keep with it. Even though I think this is the only image I'm bringing in, let's go ahead and put it in a folder as well. And we'll call this images. Collapse, collapse, and now, if you tap T, that will activate the text tool, and you can just click, and if you look, oops, shoot, hotkeys can get difficult when you have the text tool. All right, let's try that again. Click text, and you'll see the word lorem ipsum appear. If you are a graphic designer, then you're familiar with that. It's a, just a placeholder text. It's really famous. I don't know the full story behind it, but that's why that word pops up. So I want this to be the yellow color. So let's change this swatch. Double click the swatch. Set it to yellow. Oh, that's better. All right, let's choose a larger font size. See, it goes all the way to 72. Oops. Oh, well, whoops. Let's try that again. What am I doing? Oh, it's because I'm trying to use spacebar. There we go. I want something bigger than that, so let's manually pump this to like 150. Yeah, that's better. It's a lot closer. Let's control A and just, I wanted to call this new uh, dog food hyper. I'll make it all caps because the previous one was all caps. And next, what I do is I would go over here, click on this box where it says, Akumen or whatever, whatever the default font is, you can use your arrow keys to just start going through different text until you find one that you really like. In fact, I think this is the one I used. <laughs> Let's check. Yeah, it totally is. How funny is that? Okay, so I want to position this. So I tapped V. I want to position this here and let's make this font just a little bigger. So maybe 160, let's give that a shot. And 170. It feels like 170 is the, is the right answer. All right, and let's position this pretty darn close. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. All right, so the original label, so if we click on the image for the original label, it has uh, kind of this paler yellow and it's got a little bit of red going on. I'm gonna press I, which is my eyedropper tool. It's how I sample colors. And I'm gonna click on this pale yellow. I'm gonna go back to my UV snapshot layer file. I'm gonna highlight this. And then just by toggling this arrow here on my color swatches, it's gonna change it to the new yellow. 
All right, yeah, I like that better. Let's go back to our original reference. I'm gonna use my eyedropper again, and this time I'm going to tap X, and you'll notice that my pale yellow falls to the fore or the background, and the black is now in the foreground. And let's sample the red. So now, if I tap X, you can see how I can toggle between my foreground and background colors. It's just nice to have to have that option in case I want to go back to this pale yellow. All right, what am I going to do? I could duplicate this. I could duplicate this and uh, you know have a, an, a version of the word behind this that's a kind of a red color. That'd be easy. But instead, I want to just double click this and use a layer style. Let's see what would be good. Let's do. Let's do drop shadow. I know that doesn't sound intuitive, but let's change the blend mode to normal. And let's change this color to the new red that we have. Now let's up the opacity. So you can see that red is starting to appear around the border. Let's up the scale a bit. Oh, no, no, no. Take the scale down. That scale controls like the fuzzy factor, the, the um, softness of the shadow. All right, how about we try distance? There we go. Wow, that looks really good. That's like spot on. Probably position the angle earlier. Uh, maybe had a slight bit of softness to it. Like, it doesn't have to be super sharp. Yeah, I like it. That works. Hyper. There's the old label, jumper, and there's hyper. Cool. All right, so everything else is basically that workflow. I'm not going to make you sit here and watch me repeat this stuff. Um, I'll just go back over here to this version and snag some of these text layers. Let's go in here and just, let's just steal them. Let's see, we got this one. I wonder if it'll let me. Uh, copy. Hmm. Oh, sorry, I didn't grab the UV. Can it, will it work? Will it, will it? Will it, maybe? No, it didn't work. I think what I'm going to have to do to make it copy is I actually have to flatten it. Or there might be another way to do it. Hmm. Yeah, let's just rasterize it and copy it. So it doesn't want to copy the text layer over. There might be a way to do it, and I'm just not privy to how to do it. So I'm just going to press paste, and there it is. I, I made it a raster, which means, oh, it copied everything. Or no, 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 I clicked on the wrong thing. Yeah, this is the layer that I want to grab. Oh, hmm, control T, there we go. So when I rasterized it, what did that mean? It mean that I took the te it meant that I took the text and I flattened it into an image layer because it didn't want to copy all of the details of the text layer just by right clicking and copying it. I'm sure they'll do it. I just don't want to fuss around to figure it out. So let's go back in here. Let's grab the lion meat portion. Right click, you can rasterize that. And then control A, control C. It just grabs everything. Let's go back to our um, UV snapshot and just paste. Control T so it's not so hard to grab. And just position it. I can nudge it using V. Close enough. There we go. Oh yeah, the, the word. There's a word on that previous label. It's the hyper word. Is it this one? No, it's this one. Maybe. Yeah, so let's do that again. Rasterize it. Copy it. And paste it. It's just me a little bit, so you don't have to sit here and watch me go through all those, you know, toggle through all the text, try to get everything looking just perfect, just skipping ahead, essentially. I'm going to go back to my original file and undo all that stuff, because if I ever do want to go back and change it, best not to rasterize it. Okay, so now that we've got all the text done and everything's happy, we're going to move on to our next step, which is making this label more interesting, giving it some character, beating it up, scratching it, uh, maybe throwing some dirt on it. 
go ahead and tidy up this text. So I know these are all text images. I'm going to press Control E to merge them. I'm going to call these my text. And I'm going to put this plus hyper in its own folder. Let's just be my text folder. And let's give it the color purple. All right, I'm also going to go back to my fill and up that opacity back all the way up so we no longer see like the ghost of what was originally there. All right, so what I like to do when I'm getting ready to wreck something like this, like I'm going to go in and, and you know, erase bits, is I like to keep the original safe. So I'm going to double click this folder and let's call it label underscore original. And then I'm going to grab the folder and just duplicate it by dragging it over the new icon. When I do that, I have two copies now of everything I did before. I'm going to go ahead and right click this folder and there should be an option. What would happen if I just press Control E on this? Okay, it merged everything into a single image, and it still has the cool, the cool layer mask on it. That's nice. Um, yeah, I think that'll work. I don't think we need to have a folder. I can just call this. Um, uh, what do we want to call this? Like uh, damage label. Or label damaged. Just so I know what I'm doing on here. Alrighty, so there's a lot of cool things that I could do here. I think um, what I want to start with is addressing how to build custom brushes because that's one of my favorite ways to build textures and give like the impression of scratches or ripped label. So to do that, I'm going to press B, which is my brush tool. And I'm going to very quickly. I wonder if I could reset this because I'm positive that you do not have your legacy brushes. And that's actually my previous scratch brush. I want to go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to delete it. You don't have to delete yours. You don't have it. Let's go ahead and delete this group. Okay. Now, my Photoshop looks like yours. When I go over here to my brush tool, so remember brush tool is the letter B, the hotkey B, or you can just click on it over here. When you go in, you see all of these general brushes, dry media brushes, wet media brushes, special effects brushes, and you're welcome to play with all those brushes. Um, you can go in, play with their settings. The thing that I like to do, because a little old school, is I like the legacy brushes. The legacy brushes were the original brushes that came with Photoshop. If you are interested in using the legacy brushes, you can click on this little gear and click legacy brushes and it'll like, hey, do you want to restore the legacy brushes? And I'm like, yes, I do. And now when I click, I have a folder full of legacy brushes. I love these. I think they're fun. They're nostalgic for me. So what I'm looking for is I want to do some torn paper. So I'm looking for a brush with some texture to work with. Again, there's nothing wrong with using all these effects brushes thing that annoys me with them is they are often set to a specific tool. So if I grab a brush that I think is really neat, it will only apply to the eraser or it will only apply to the clone tool. I, I just get annoyed. So let's go ahead and look for something with some texture. Something interesting. That's kind of cool. That watercolor wash. Hmm. Just want to choose something pre-existing to build off of. That's what I'm getting at. Something kind of ruggedy. Ooh, there, that charcoal. Let's click it. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, that's a good start. So what I want to do is I want to create a brush that gives me kind of the feeling of torn paper. So in order to edit this default that I've selected, I'm going to go ahead and press F5. F5 will activate the brush settings menu. And this menu is a whole lot of fun. Um, let's just go through quickly some of the things you can do. Brush tip settings allow you to just kind of pick, you know, some different settings for the tip of the brush, the default scale that you're going for with this brush. You can choose to rotate that brush tip so you can see how that affects it. You can also narrow it down and see how that affects it. 
I love taking spacing out. Usually when I'm using a single stroke, if I expand the spacing, it, it's just a little weird. I mean, sometimes you'll want it that way, but I personally prefer avoiding gaps in my spacing. Next is shape dynamics, and this can control things like the size, the angle, the roundness. So jitter just means randomization. So if I up the size gender, gender, jitter, if I up the size jitter, you can see that every time I draw with this, every single um, brush tip is going to change size. The scale is going to constantly be rotating. Um, angle jitter causes it to rotate. So every time I'm, you know, as I'm drawing, the tip is constantly rotating, which you don't notice a huge change, but the more elaborate brush, the more obvious that change becomes. Uh, roundness jitter, that's kind of interesting. Ooh, I really like that. I'm going to keep the roundness jitter on. I really want this size jitter to be controlled by my pen pressure. You see this little exclamation mark because I don't have my tablet plug plugged in at the moment, but if I want to put scratches on this, which I did in my first version, I like having that, that pen pressure so I can just draw scratches. Uh, scattering is basically how much scattering is happening with the texture inside the, inside the stroke. Uh, you can also up the count which looks like this. It, it's a mess. I never touch count because the higher you put the count, the more it RAM it uses to try to calculate it. So I usually don't touch count unless it's a very simple brush. Texture will superimpose a texture on it. I don't want to do that because it kind of muddies down this effect I like. Dual brush is already activated and basically what that does is it takes another brush and superimposes it over the first one. If I turn off dual brush, it's subtle, but you can kind of see that another brush is impacting the flow and the look and aesthetic. Color dynamics, that just means that, well actually, color dynamics is completely turned off here. Uh, but let's say I upped the hue jitter. Check it out. Notice how every brush stroke is a different color? Because it's jittering, it's um, going through all the different colors. I could also do like foreground and background jitter. So you see the red and the yellow there? It's going to constantly be jumping between that red and the yellow. So that's what that jitter is about. There's also brightness and saturation jitter. Um, transfer has to do with opacity. And I actually kind of think I might want some of that. Yeah, I think that's going to have a kind of a cool effect. Uh, flow jitter can also have an effect. Like, I think it goes a little too far. Keep the flow jitter off. Um, there's also brush pose, so if you're using a stylus and depending on how you position the brush, it could change the effect of how the stroke is drawn. Noise just adds a layer of no noise. You can't really see it because this brush is already noisy, but if it were like a base, then like, like a basic flat brush, then you'd probably see some texture applied. Uh, wet edges kind of gives this the effect kind of feel of watercolor and I actually really like how that looks. I might keep that. And uh, build up just gives the illusion of building up with each stroke, kind of imitating oil paint. Protect texture. I mean you get the idea. You can play with all these settings. Again to access it just press F5. Alright so I'm going to go ahead and save this brush. If I want to save a brush that I've created I just press this plus sign down here and it will ask me what I want to save this. I'm going to call it um, tear, or is that tear? I don't know. Let's just call it um, uh, ripping. I know I can spell that right. Um, do not include tool settings. That just means that it's going to jump back every time to the, uh, to the brush tool. And I want to use the eraser tool with this. So I'm going to close this up, and I'm going to grab my eraser. E for eraser. And I'm going to grab my ripping tool, which or ripping paintbrush color to give that rip aesthetic. And check it out. Watch what happens when I erase. Nothing happens. That's what. Hold on. Oops. I got my eraser. Is it the right tool? Eraser. Cool, cool. Zoom in. And why are we not eras Oh, because <laughs> I have the other layer on. How silly of me. Okay. Now we can do it. Yeah, it's kind of trying to give it some, it might be a little too noisy, a little too much. Let's dial some of that back. Let's go back to F5. 
think maybe the transfer was too much. Maybe not. Maybe it's not transfer that's too much. Something's too much here. Hmm. What else did I change? Maybe it's the angle jitter? No, I, I still like that. No, I don't remember what I changed, but it's just, it feels a little too loud now. Around the edges. Let's, uh, you know, let's just roll with it. I don't want to sit here all day. Um, I'm just going to kind of play with this a little. We kind of show some scuffs. Places I might rip it. I'm going to shrink this down real low and just kind of add a scratch or two. It's not as nice as using a stylus to do it, but you know, any place where you think it would look cool to have like a little hole in your mesh, or not your mesh, your label. Kind of, you know, things get dropped, things get scuffed. That's kind of what I'm trying to imitate here. Now, one thing that I notice whenever I see a, a scuffed or scratched up label is oftentimes you will see the paper that it's printed on. What do I mean by that? I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to put it underneath my new, um, my new label. Zoom in. I'm going to grab my brush tool and I'm going to shrink this down really low. And I'm going to choose wheat as my color. Tap D and X. That makes it white. I don't really like that. It looks. I don't think it's going to work on the scratch. Let's do it up here. So basically, what I want to do, let's make it a little bigger, is just kind of paint a little kiss of white. I definitely. Me too. There we go. We just want to put a little bit of white in there, and that gives the illusion of just that ripped paper. You know what I mean? Now, I want to put these in a folder, so I'm going to create a new folder. And kind of a cool technique, you can grab the mask that's on the image and put it on a folder instead. Grab these two, stick them in the folder. And now I don't have to worry about drawing outside the lines. I'm going to call this white. And this new folder is still my label. Uh, we'll just call it form. All right, so if I zoom out, see that just that little kiss of white looks really good, especially over here in something like this little scuffed hole here. Oh, helps if I'm in the right layer. There. Just a small little detail. I'm going to go in with the eraser tool and erase a little more of this so it doesn't... Yeah. Ooh, let's not forget over here. Go back to the white layer. Press B for brush. Yeah. I mean, you can do way more with this. You can go ham with it. You can make any kind of textured brush you want. You could add mud. You could add um, blood, slime, you name it. Anything you want to do to just add a little bit more character to your label. Just to, you know, give it some interest. I think it feels a little top heavy right now. I'm going to grab that eraser tool again. Just want to get a little bit going. There we go. Just holding down. I'm not drawing directly on the edge. I'm just letting the edge of the brush kind of just gently texture part of the label. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So now that I got this in a place that I like it, let's go ahead and start discussing the workflow for you know, adding some dirt and some, some muck on it. Much to my deep frustration, my recording software decided to 
not capture the last step of this tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and re-record it. I'm going to go over here and get rid of this muck layer that I've created. And let's start over. All right, so the last part of this that I just finished was before the app said stop recording was to finish the label, finish scratching it up and beating it up. Now we're going to go ahead and add some muck. First step, I'm going to create an empty layer inside my folder, the one that has the existing label and the white layer that underlines the tear. I'm going to name this new layer muck and it's going to sit on top of the label damage and the white layer. Okay. Next, I'm just going to use, it doesn't really matter what color I use, I think I'm going to stick with white or maybe a gray, gray might even be better. And um, I'm going to grab my brush tool and I'm going to have the same, you know, ripping texture that I used for the tears because it's also, you know, it's also good for other things. If I, if I bump up the scale, which remember you can use the bracket keys next to the letter P to scale up and scale down your brush. Just gonna paint on this. Oof, that's cool. Just kind of add a little dirt on there. If I don't, if I, if this feels like a little too much dirt, I can also grab my eraser, which has the same brush, and just kind of go in. Maybe drop. Oh, I already dropped the opacity. You can go up here and drop the opacity on like your eraser or your brush tool, and that kind of has the effect of dialing back the intensity. So if I go in and I start erasing with this, you can see that it doesn't erase everything. It just takes away some of the texture. If I feel like it's a little too much, kind of adds a little bit more randomization here. There we go. Cool. So <coughs> once I have this general sense of dirt and grime, I want to go ahead and start making it look like dirt and grime. And the best way to do that is to go online and find yourself a texture. So I pulled this one off of Google and I want to use this to kind of add a little more interest and a little bit more, oops, a little bit more interest and a little bit more um, of a compelling effect to what I've painted here. Before I do that, I'm going to use my eraser tool. I just want to erase some of the dirt that's overlapping my tears because I like these tears. I don't want to hide them. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I'll just take out some of this over here where the label's torn. I want it to look like a like a sharp end right there where my where it should be frayed. Mm, let's go ahead and do this around the bottom a little. Okay. All right. So how are we going to take this texture and superimpose it over there? Well, your first step after you find a texture and you open it in Photoshop, you're going to want to go to Edit, Define Pattern. This window is going to pop up and you can name this whatever you want. I'll just call it Muck. And now it has been saved into Photos, Photoshop's texture library. Let's go ahead and go back to the demo. I'm going to double click the Muck layer that I painted. And in the Layer Styles menu, let's go for the Pattern Overlay. Now, the current overlay is the previous one I had loaded. By default, let's go Restore to Default. This is how it typically looks when you activate the Pattern Overlay. The default pattern kind of looks like a jungle brush. But if you go in here and you click on the pattern, you can see below these folders, any sort of texture that you may have loaded into Photoshop, including this one, which muck, right? Now what's cool is I can play around with different aspects of this, like texture super, uh, this texture that I've superimposed. I can do things like drop the opacity, kind of let that uh, grayish color blend through a little more. I can also change the blending mode, change it to multiply to get more of a dark effect. Maybe change it to soft light or maybe color burn. It's really up to you. I think I'm going to leave it normal. I, I really like how that looks. I can also rotate the angle of this texture right here. Now this texture has got a slight problem to it. See this right here? This is a texture seam. If you're going to bring in a texture like this, you're going to have to do one of two things. One, you could go in and just scale this up so that you don't see the seam or you can fix the seam. 
So I'm going to press cancel and I'm going to choose to do the later. I'm going to choose to fix this seam. So in order to fix the seam, the first thing you need to do is open up your clone stamp tool. Okay, make sure it has a soft brush like outer area. So typically the hardness setting is either all the way up where it's got a really sharp edge or you can take the hardness all the way down and have a soft edge. You want to have more of a soft edge. Okay, next thing we need to do is we need to go up to filter and we need to go to other and we're looking for offset. So what offset does is it treats the texture like it's already tiled and it allows you to offset to see the seams. So I'm going to go ahead and start by saying let's go uh, 100 on the horizontal. And you see how a seam has appeared? I'll go ahead and press OK. Let's go ahead and click on a target source. I'm going to press down Alt and I'm going to source part of the picture over here. And then let me scale this up a little and boom, holding down shift. Now it doesn't do a perfect job. You can still see some variation there. Another really cool tool you could try is the healing brush tool. So I'm going to go over here, click Alt, cite a new part of the source, another part of the picture, and draw over the seam. There we go. As you can see, the healing brush tool tends to have better outcomes because it's a, it's a little bit more intelligent than the clone tool. The clone stamp tool is doing like a perfect copy and paste from wherever you are sourcing. Whereas the healing brush tool is going to be more uh, content aware, kind of like our content aware fill. This is actually looking at what's going on around the brush, not just the sampled area. Okay, so next what I want to do is I want to go back into my filter, other, and I want to go into offset. Now notice that when I opened offset, it immediately jumped to the right, and that's because I had this set to 100. That really doesn't matter. I can set this back to zero and set this one to 100. Press OK. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and grab a sample area. Let's go ahead and hold down Shift and Paint, and we're done. So we've effectively fixed the tiling issue with this image. Let's go ahead and go to Edit, Define Pattern. We'll call this Muck new, or maybe Muck 2.0. Press OK. Go back to the demo layer. Double click Muck. Let's go ahead and do that pattern overlay. We can go ahead and reset to the defaults. And this time I'm going to click on my new Muck image. And looky there, the seam is gone. And we can juxtapose it with the old one. And this one, let's take a look. Right there you can see the, um, the place where the texture is meeting the corners of the page. If I go back and I grab my new one, it disappears because we've offset and we've repaired using the healing brush tool. So there you have it. If you want to go ahead and play with this, by all means, create your own texture that you can superimpose over your painted area. You can also go in and play with other layer style options, things like uh, like color overlay, which adds, you know, a little bit of a extra layer of complexity. You can also play with the blend modes. So if you add more gradients, more colors, more patterns, you can blend them. Just have fun. Go wild with it. You can also go to the main layer itself and drop the opacity of everything that you've built so that you've got like an extra layer of control. Now, <coughs> the last thing that I need to address is this label right here. This label was also something that I had done in the previous recording that didn't get captured. So let's go ahead and show you how to get that kind of date on your can. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go File, Open, let's see, Pictures. There is a food can that I found on Google. I'm just opening it up, and I'm going to use this to basically steal the, the code off their can. Let's begin by just lassoing it, lassoing the selection that we're going to want. 
Next, I'm going to invert my selection, which is shift control i and just cut everything else around it. Now, this was a JPEG, so there's no transparency. Instead, it's going to adopt whatever color is in my background swatch whenever I cut. Let's press undo. In order to avoid that, just go into your layers menu and double click the background image. And now it's got a it's got a transparency feature. If I press control X, now I see transparency, which is what I would prefer. All right. Now, in order to get rid of all this gray, I'm going to start by pressing control U and really making sure there's no other color and it's just a grayscale channel. Next, I'm going to build some contrast between those grays by going into my levels. So down here, I can control like the overall black and white of the scene, like the scaling of it. And down here, or up here, I can adjust more specifically the black and white contrast between whatever range I set down here. It doesn't seem like I really need to mess with these right now in order to get kind of what I want. I'm just trying to push the contrast about as much as it will let me. Good. Next, I'm going to go over to my select and I'm going to ask it to select a color range. And I'm going to highlight the white and press OK. And then I'm going to press Control X. It does a pretty good job of taking out most of the white. In fact, if I were to create a new layer, Press X to swap my foreground and background. Press G for my paint bucket. Yeah, it does a pretty good job. There is some kind of scratchiness here, little little artifacting of gray, but I kind of like it. I kind of want to keep that in my can. So I'm going to just click on this layer. This is the actual barcode, not barcode, but expiration date. Let's grab the marquee tool. Let's copy this to the clipboard. And let's go back to our demo. Now, before we place it, we got to know where we're placing it. So let's turn the background image on and turn our UV snapshot guide back on. On the left is the bottom of my can, and this one is the right, if you're, or the top. If you're not sure if which one is the bottom or the top of your can, you could place the label, upload it to Substance Painter. If it's not on the end of the can that you want, then just drag it, fix it, re-upload it. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to control V, which adds it here as a new, as a new layer. I'm going to press control T and I'm going to shrink this down <coughs> and place it on my can. Now that I'm seeing this against a dark background, I don't know that I love what's left over as much as I thought I did. Let's try using the quick selection tool. It's a little too, I don't know. I don't think it's quite grabbing what I want it to. Let's try turning off the guy. Going to select and trying to grab that um, color range again. I wonder if it's trying to grab all the gray in the background here. Let's turn this off and this off too. Select color range. That's better. Control X. It's looking a little bit better. Let's reset my eraser tool. Set to opacity is still set low. back to levels and just use the levels to force it to be more black. There we go. Now the white halo is not so noticeable. And that is one technique for just pulling the expiration date off of a real can and placing it in your UV snapshot. Once you're done, turn off your background element and turn off the guide itself, because if you do not turn off this guide, that guide is going to upload with your texture. In the next tutorial, we are going to go over how to take this label and bring it into Substance Painter. We're also going to talk about how to change this label up so that you are applying it to other channels 
within the PBR workflow. What we've painted here is your color map. There are other maps that need to be taken into consideration, such as your metal map, such as your roughness map. So we'll talk about that more next time. Thank you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful day.